Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Wendy and I'll be your host today. Our special guests are Paul Clemens Bart and Marvin Bratke. They're architects, designers, and co-founders of the Bart Bratke Design Studio. Uh, today, they'll give us a sneak peek into predictive planning, which is the core design methodology in their studio. Uh, it allows them to create inclusive, unconventional, and multidisciplinary spaces. Uh, we'll also get a glimpse into their practice and academic projects and have an, inclus an exclusive uh, opportunity to ask them questions about their design philosophy and projects. Paul and Marvin are actively engaging in teaching, academia, and consulting. Uh, they lecture on spatial strategies, architectural innovation, and the studio's research at uh, universities, conferences, public events, that sort of thing. Uh, Paul held teaching positions at universities worldwide, for example, at the Architectural Association London, the Bartlett UCL, and Cooper Union NYC. Uh, while Marvin is a lecturer at the Institute uh, for Architecture and Media at TU Graz. He held a visiting professorship at Matthias Academy of Arts in Kiel, and together they held a visiting professorship at UISEK in Quito. But that's not all. You'll witness a world premiere and never published material on their new innovative development that combines sustainable design, upcycling, and cutting edge hybrid structural systems and material science. Um, in their interview for Lockup Perspectives Volume 2, um, they said, uh, we believe that technological progress will change our perception of reality as we know it today. We are constantly looking for answers in architecture and design to tackle these technological frontiers with a focus on the notion of what being human means in this future society. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Paul and Marvin. Feel free to ask them questions throughout their presentation by just typing them in the chat. Wow, uh, thank you for that introduction. We're very, uh, we're very happy to be here. Um, also a little bit flattered right now. <laughs> um, now, now, thanks a lot. Um, we're um, very, very happy uh, like to collaborate with you guys again. Yeah, we had like in the past already quite a um, couple of uh, cool things um, that we produced or that we arranged or also some adventures we lived uh, through together and we cannot wait um, for this one and of course also um, for the next ones. Um, and I will start sharing my screen now, right? Um, because we prepared um, a little presentation um, for today as well. Just let me... Um, let me see. So can everybody see it um, right now? Paul, can you see it? Yep, there we go. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, we, like, it's always like with this, uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, new tools, we talk a little, lot about the future, yeah, and sometimes we cannot handle the uh, Zoom calls or WebEx. Um, our lecture um, today is called um, Anticipating Architecture. And um, what we want to do today is actually um, let's give uh, yeah, like an academic uh, lecture or something more general, but we would like to show you um, more a cross section of uh, what our studio um, has been doing um, the last yeah, months, the last years, also um, actively letting you part of uh, recent uh, projects, which is also very important for us um, to share these things and not hide them behind like a firewall. Um, we would like uh, to talk with you about our um, methodology in the office. I think the introduction there um, was also like giving a hint about how we work. Um, and in this terms, also like the subtitle of the lecture is um, predictive planning um, for transformative spaces and how we see that. Um, oops, let me just in. No. Paul, I think you're. Um, you have to click further. I don't know. I, it's not possible for me at the moment. So, um, and just uh, as a little introduction, we prepared uh, some slides about um, the methodology of our studio and how we see um, architecture. Um, today, we see a lot in our urbanism, in the construction of our cities. Um, we built like uh, yeah with like like very limited and like like a, a temporary background yeah like our cities we see is usually constructed in our master planning as a, a static construct that is um, permanent and also 
yeah, very building oriented, very oriented. Um, we do not think that this necessarily represents um, kind of how we should build um, in the future or how we should even um, build today anymore, since we live like um, in a society of um, accelerated information exchange, of accelerated um, knowledge exchange, we think also um, our cities um, have to become more dynamic, have to become more um, transformative and of course human oriented. So that means our cities have to become more a transformative um, system that reacts to this ever increasing um, streams of information flow and therefore can also adapt um, towards them. And um, to show you a little bit about the myth methodology, um, how we work on our projects, um, we made something like a little mind map, uh, so to say, um, where like also where you can see like how we usually um, tackle our um, not only uh, projects that we do in practice, but also our academic work. And it always um, starts with kind of an analytical phase that is about like discovering projects, yeah? developing um, strategies um, together with our clients, together with our um, students. A very important aspect is um, prototyping in our work, yeah, um, something um, that becomes, I think, very necessary also when you think about, um, yeah, systems, architectures that haven't been done before in a way or that try to create um, something new. Um, then usually the next phase is something we call make, it's like a very um, simple term, but in the end of the day, it just refers to actually what we do as architects, yeah, we want to realize projects, um, put them um, into reality. And um, for us also, um, we will talk a lot about in this lecture about um, predictive planning models, about holistic planning, about like circular economy um, approaches in architecture and design. And in this case, also this last phase that you see there, um, which is called grow in this diagram, um, becomes very important for us because for us, when the like project is finished, when the project is realized, this is not actually the um, final point for us because we usually um, want to stay with our clients. Um, we want to um, monitor projects, we collect um, data, we create um, guidelines and documentation of the project so we can actually scale and adapt and create something um, that is more yeah, holistically planned and more part of this um, yeah, circular economy approach, yeah, where also um, we think about not only um, the construction itself, but also the afterlife of a building or how the materials will be um, reused. Um, the way we set up our studio is um, kind of uh, yeah, like a platform, as uh, you might see when you go to our website or when you know our work. Um, there's like uh, a lot of stuff we're interested in, in general. Um, and we also try to make these little maps like on this page uh, to kind of frame it and remind ourselves um, um, how we, yeah, or like what work modes um, we, can, uh, um, we can apply. And also this lecture today um, is kind of giving you an outlook basically um, over our academic work and how this influences um, us in practice. And this is also a diagram that um, should show us um, how academia and research actually in our studio is influencing um, real life projects. Um, currently, like we have two main studios, we're developing um, also a third one uh, in the Asian Pacific region. Um, I'm joining you right now uh, from Berlin. Yeah, it's a very rainy weather. Uh, Paul is uh, joining from New York. Um, which is at the moment we have this very, um, yeah, like special situation with the pandemic as well that is also um, boosting the digitalization, yeah, and like also like how we come um, together in uh, yeah, virtual meetings um, like this. So, and it's also um, interesting to see, yeah, across all time zones how um, the people can actually work together, how they can collaborate, and how they um, can interact in these uh, yeah, new modes. And what the lecture basically shows you, yeah, I mentioned it before, um, this is just a, like a little excerpt of projects we're doing um, at the moment. There will be, be some more later in the presentation. 
Um, these are projects from our practice. Um, they are, yeah, in, in this case, they're kind of larger scale. So we work like um, also on very different scales. So you see here like um, something that comes more from master planning and urbanism, residential um, developments, um, for example, in the middle, you see like an opera house um, or um, um, or a research uh, center, which is um, in a remote uh, region in Ecuador as well. Um, so basically, like the field of um, the architecture we're doing is quite diverse, but it's kind of um, unified through these um, yeah, working methodologies we were just talking about and also our general approach um, to architecture that always um, connects the practice um, with research and academia. And on this slide, there are just um, some recent student projects from um, uh, the universities that were just mentioned in the um, introductions. On some of them, we will um, yeah we have a little closer look uh, today. Um, but um, what is interesting to frame all of this, I think, is um, also part of today's lecture: how we come actually from like very future-driven topics um, that are usually researched in academic surroundings, and how we apply them like part by part in our um, real life um, projects. And this is also why the main chapter of the presentation is called From Research to Practice. Um, usually we do it vice versa to give like an outlook on the future. Today we wanted to frame it um, the other way um, around. Um, also that you see kind of or that uh, when students are, for example, in the um, in the meeting today, that you can see that actually some stuff starts with an abstract mind model. And then um, we also maybe want to show the story how, um, yeah, like interesting or innovative concepts or ideas are, or are being able to be implemented in real life. Um, and therefore, um, we always go a little bit um, back. Um, that's a slide we show usually um, very often. Um, it's a, I think it's a little provocative as well. Um, it puts two things together on the left side. There's the Seagram um, building, uh, a picture of the construction we like uh, very much. On the right side, um, there's a picture of the architecture uh, machine group um, at the MIT. And um, we always think when we look at the left side on the picture, it's uh, very interesting to see that in construction and architecture itself that not so many things changes yeah this is a building built in the 50s um there are many like changes on a micro level let's say yeah that make our buildings um look different um but not so much actually um and we think there's a certain yeah like resilience or transformative aspects that are needed in today's time um missing in these static constructs we are developing at the moment um, and one of this uh, very static construct is actually the notion of the single family house um, that um, or with a garden around. Yeah, um, it's kind of like a typology in architecture that takes a lot of space and um, yeah, used to have um, its uh, uprising yeah, in the age um, of um, yeah, personal mobility, yeah, the age of the car. Um, this is like a typology that developed with emerging uh, um, suburban models, um, firstly in America, then also in other countries. And um, today we live in a uh, like in an age of um, yeah urbanization. Um, most of the people in the world uh, live in cities. Many more will live in mega cities tomorrow. So um, what we are questioning at the moment is like. Um, rather than having a model that takes large amounts of horizontal spaces, how we um, deal or how we tackle actually with um, yeah, urban densification models, with autonomous system in urbanization, um, when our populations rise, and also basically how we get uh, from a very two-dimensional planning level into a more three-dimensional and interactive space. Paul, is this working? Your microphone is off. Apologies. Um, um, I'm just a quick for the video. I think the video is not starting from this side. 
Um, wait, then let me. So it's just I cannot control it when you are controlling it. So. Um. Should I maybe stop control? Let me do it from the screen. Is that easier? Yes, yes, that would be easier. Yeah. Okay, ah, super, perfect. Now it starts. Cool. Okay. First technical problem solved. Um, so this is a little bit the plus from the past where a lot of our attitude and I think understanding of design and topics that Marvin just explained um, have kind of been rooted in a research project we did at the Architectural Association many, many years ago um, called NOMAD, um, what we see here in the video. And it's really looking at architecture as something that is an open platform, like this non-finite building system of many parts with agency that come together. Um, and we really were interested in developing something that is fully non-hierarchical and fully distributed. Um, and a system that is negotiating architectural space as something that is a never-ending process, a never-ending process of changing environments, of changing conditions and expectations. Um, in this case, it was manifested in this proposal of a fully automatized modular robotic building kit. Um, if you go next slide. But in the last years, um, we've been looking to applying similar goals, both in our research and professional work, um, and really to looking to get some interference with sound, I think. Maybe if you could mute yourself. I can hear you. Um, could you mute yourself? Thank you. Um, I am much better. Uh, in the last years, we've been applying similar goals, um, both in our research and professional work that we've been first developing or first researching in this um, robotic building systems. Um, but that are all also revolving around the topics kind of as our main pillars that we're interested in of developing architectural systems with agency, independence, and revolving around the topic of automation. Um, and also systems that revolve around the topics of material coalescence and the idea of reconfiguration um, and this idea of scalability and bottom-up processes. So we designing architect systems that can be ad adaptive to circumstances in real time, uh, kind of through predictive and analytical data analysis and smart planning and creating new models of autonomous and also collective construction. And that can mean either collective by means by humans or by automation or robots or collective use of materials. But this idea of local interaction and giving a platform of many things coming together um, of building one thing. Um, so if you go on the next slide. Over the last two years, uh, we've been teaching at the AA Visiting School in New York together with Roman Weber from the MIT Media Lab. And we've been kind of applying this idea of distributed robotics to enhance our urban infrastructure and guidance systems and bringing the possibility to deploy urban infrastructure into in real time. Um, so the research kind of proposes the implementation of new types of three dimensional infrastructure in an urban context. And together with the students, we were investigating how robotic building methods can upgrade urban distribution of goods or interaction and navigation on the street. And we kind of identified this move towards the three-dimensional urban infrastructure, not as a technological issue, but really as a development that has to be addressed in architecture or as an architectural design challenge. Um, so we were asking the students the question how future transportation and future mobility solutions can interface with the existing city fabric and how they can be deployed, like a lot of the consumer elect uh, the, uh, electronic developments, how can these consumer electronic developments be deployed on an urban scale? Um, next slide, please. There was one proof student who, um, that we're proposing the idea of an urban delivery drone that kind of creates a new delivery logistics infrastructure where our new mode of consuming gets an urban presence for autonomic logistics and e-commerce distribution in the city. 
So they were proposing a delivery system and an architectural response to the potential shortcomings and threats of our new logistic requirements, where they were tackling urban integration with something like a creation of a physical magnification of e-commerce and digitized infrastructure. So if you go on the next slide, please. Um, they were basically creating an automatized last mile solution that is autonomously distributing goods inside the city, a kind of like, yeah, they had this image of a homing kitchen of the digital age. Um, that is fundamentally a system that is combining custom URVs with like a lightweight modular frame and an, an inflatable pouch for storage of goods. And that is coming together in larger aggregations of the modules serving kind of as a neighborhood packing station for sending and receiving of goods. And the idea was really on the one hand, the designing of the special object or the UAV, but also the design of a holistic peer to peer or business to business system where we currently have two distinct logistical networks of sending and receiving mail, which are completely separate in our world today. And this idea was really to bring this idea of peer to peer into one unified system of sending and receiving. Um, next, please. Another group of students was looking at a proposal they called the Space Navigator, which is kind of a response to the increased autonomy of our transportation and questing the static nature, nature of the infrastructure that defines our streetscapes today or over the last hundred years. Um, so next, please. We just talked about this before the meeting started with Wendy actually about how, who that do the streets belong to. And uh, before the era of the car, the streets actually belong to the pedestrians. And we just talked about there's a really nice development at the moment during, at least here in New York, during the lockdown, a lot of the streets are being pedestrianized and are actually being taken back by the people in a way. And it used to be like this, where the streets were a very um, a shared space and not a space that is hierarchical. Like we have a very hierarchical streetscape at the moment with hard borders that are defined by sidewalks, hard cars, traffic signs, street lights, that cover, kind of govern the way how everyone participates in the street life. And we see a very clear shift from this with autonomous mobility where the streetscape gets democratized again, or there's a potential of having, creating a non-hierarchical but shared open space. Um, next slide, please. So the students were designing a mobile modular system that is consisting of active UAVs that enable the passive and active continents and that can dynamically program the streets. And the idea was to propose a shift away from static urban street infrastructure and more building something that, not building something for single purpose, like our street light and street infrastructures today, but something like a universal navigator that can dynamically rearrange for various use cases and be deployed wherever it needed the most. Um, next, please. So these use cases in this case can vary from anything from traffic guidance, creating temporary barriers, wayfinding, uh, or emergency lighting and emergency relief, but really being deployed in real time where they are needed the most instead of having a static streetscape that is not changing or not, um, not adapting to its needs. Um, so these are some of the topics that I think that we look at in our we are interested in where how does technological development affect us in different scales but also if you're looking at this like this is a product design scale but we're thinking that a product design scale can tackle urban urban scale design challenges and vice versa so we really are interested in this interchangeability of scales and how automation tickles through all of them and mutually influences each other um, so every studio that we teach, we kind of look at a contemporary challenge or something that we see relevant today. Um, and next slide, please. In the case of the visiting school, it's a specific thing where also people, students arrive in a city to use the city as their playing ground of exploration. And most of the students are new to New York as well. Um, and this year, here with the pandemic, we've been kind of put in a different spot than we were normally. Because for most people in New York in the last six months was not uh, Fifth Avenue and the Empire State, but kind of like, I guess what you see in the background, a screen, a pot plant and a window, like we are all at home. And the students were at home in their home countries. 
so this pandemic has really put the city's building industries challenges in the spotlight, but also we were asking the questions, how can we do a studio that revolves around New York if nobody's actually here and if there's no site, there's no, no exploration in the city. But um, we wanted to focus on the positive developments that we've seen during the lockdown, lockdown. And we really experienced a lot of new forms of artistic creation and expression, uh, like gamification, mass multiplayer mechanisms, augmentation and virtual reality spaces, where people are much more open to express themselves creatively in uh, virtual environments. And the boundaries of the physical and virtual environment has been extremely blurred in these last six months as we, I mean, we see at this lecture, this is every, things have been digitalized and people started to accept this as a new reality. Um, so during the visiting school, we were really studying New York together with the students, but not as a site, but more as an abstracted visual grammar. As we, New York has always been much more than the physical presence of New York, but it's kind of this endless pool of images, symbols, gestures, and associations that everyone has. So the idea for the students was to identify the fingerprint of the city, what are the fingerprint of the city in our collective memory, um, even if you're not physically experiences, and then kind of abstract, organize and analyze uh, this architectural form into a toolkit or building kit of modular elements. Um, next, please. So in this virtual studio, we had uh, students from 11 countries and we really explored the future of the cities in a virtual realm through experimentation. Um, using augmented reality and the alteration of real physical spaces through digital means. So the, the students were studying different infrastructure typologies and urban morphologies from Times Square to the Art Deco and parts of the city um, that make up New York. And then digitally reconfigure and explore how these spaces can be experienced in the future, both physically and digitally. So they were kind of creating these architectural artifacts built out of discrete building elements of found objects within the city. Um, this is a range of the output that really tackles everything from the subway to the, uh, yeah, the Brooklyn Brownstone. We'll see a few more in detail. Um, and then fundamentally the output, since everyone was at home, if you go on the next slide, please. The students are basically learning the understanding of how to use generative design tools. Um, so to bringing these pieces together using computational building logics and computational assembly logics and transforming them into new augmented models that can be called upon anywhere in the world. So if the students can't come to New York, the idea is New York is coming to them. Um, and we worked in close collaboration with Folocram, uh, uh, AR firm based in Melbourne, friends of ours, that to create this instant mixed reality experience that can be applied on smartphones and basically called upon any in the world with your smartphone by the students where they took parts of New York into their home country and vice versa. So we had this exchange of virtual architectural artifacts worldwide and culminated in the end in a virtual vernissage where all the results were being live on display and experience in real time uh, for the crits and all visitors all around the world. If you go on the next slide. Just see some of the example output where, yeah, the studio aimed to turn this image of the city into what we call the repertoire of space making. Uh, and the students were investigating hidden layers, urban relics uh, of that make up the city from on the left, the mass media at Times Square, or the urban vernacular of Brooklyn and the streetscapes in New York City on the right. And we really treated it in this attitude of what we call the, uh, the musical mixtape, like this um, history of New York of uh, create bottom up processes and the history of remixing and recreating new, uh, new configuration and new spatial situations out of existing, uh, existing conditions or found conditions. Um, so yeah, this was kind of creating a new interactive layer of the city using digital phenomena like algorithmic bias, glitches, mass media, 
compression and distortion filters to kind of create this augmented version of New York um, overlaid on the existing fabric. Um, next slide, please. Research year, you see that I use this. The idea was about this examination and recontextualizing of found objects. So from ornamentation of Art Deco to the intricacies of the bridges and then augment them via real existing um, parts of the city. And in this case, it was something um, that was using um, urban debris or construction waste. And if you go on the next slide, uh, so one of the student was uh, using 3D scans of real construction waste. So it was, she was basically using a catalog of 3D scans and using all the construction waste that can be found in the city from concrete blocks or wasted stones, scanning them and then using these scanned models uh, as your building parts or building blocks to rebuild new spatial configurations. So turning waste into potential, we call it healing from waste, like in this potential infill into demolished buildings or building on itself, but basically giving a, a tool or an algorithm a goal to build something with found objects or with, um, with scanned real digital material um, in this case. Um, next slide, please. I was in a group uh, who was looking at the New York subway and really reimagined the New York subway uh, as instead of this overlaid master plan and grid that is very stringent and very rigid in New York City, um, as this really self-organizing network that is growing bottom up, where if you give the subway basically a playing crowd and it grows itself, how would the subway grow? Is in this case vertically creating this vertically growing transportation system, uh, subway scraper, as we called it, as kind of this, yeah, playful. Uh, interpretation of what are the discrete elements that made up our infrastructure and how can they be put into new spatial challenges and configurations. Um, in this case, the students were based in Hong Kong, an uh, extremely high rise city. So they plugged in this New York, this vertically growing New York skyscraper into the existing transit system in Hong Kong and augmented it with, um, uh, with the New York Metro, uh, with the Hong Kong Metro. Next, please. So you can see the idea was basically this interface of physical and virtual, where the studio was leveraging cultural and semantic layers into new uh, missions. Um, and it kind of, I think what goes through with all the topics that we're looking in our field of research was that the studio aimed to expand the role of the students from designer of single objects, but really in creating not static artifacts, but something like what we call a system architect. So they were developing a building system and a building logic where they produce something that is adaptive and where we can continuously generate endless novel forms and respond to endless changing cityscapes and endless changing site conditions. And um, something like this, um, we also did um, in the studio before uh, this year. Um, this was at uh, TU Graz. And um, the interesting thing about um, like this uh, step from the project you've seen uh, before, and this one now is actually that we um, kind of, uh, um, yeah, we have like a, a step in scale. Yeah, we come from like an urban scale. We come from uh, uh, something that was also first more artistically inspired, um, then it became something that um, became actually very useful, then it became very interactive. And the tools we used for that, yeah, like, um, or the scripts we wrote, the digital uh, tools we developed with the students are actually um, the same tools that uh, come into play um, in the project or like in the course we did before. It was um, called Distributed Tectonics. And um, also this course was uh, kind of affected by the um, by the pandemic um, situation. Originally, we were um, planning um, to build like a real life stage for the 15 seconds festival. Uh, it's like a, a, a um, like a tech and innovation festival in Graz with the students. Um, yeah, using uh, um, discrete uh, yeah, uh, model algorithms um, to do that. Um, and uh, during the course of the 
um, during um, yeah, the course of time, start of the pandemic, it actually developed um, into something bigger. And um, we just wanted to showcase one of the projects um, of the course. Um, in this one, it was called um, System uh, Too Simple. Um, and this is basically um, a system that is based on a very simple, yeah, like the name implies, a very simple logic of uh, two elements. It's a kit of parts. Um, that has um, yeah one local and one uh, global element yeah one connector that is um, yeah uh, that has a certain uh, intelligence or smartness in it and one element um, that is uh, um, yeah we always called it uh, in quotation marks the dump um, element that actually um, yeah creates um, kind of the spatial ambience of the structure and this is what you see here um, realized in um, yeah like these uh, um, wood wooden slabs. As you see, um, the system can be applied in two different uh, methodologies. Yeah, one is indoor, one is outdoor. Um, it, it creates um, very different uh, spatial arrangements um, that were um, yeah, um, that were analyzed. Yeah, we use predictive software um, to do this. We use custom algorithms to um, actually uh, create like uh, multiple structures that were afterwards uh, um, analyzed and then brought back. Um, into yeah, like into certain scenarios um, we uh, predefined in this course. Um, what you see here is uh, kind of like a two-use scenario. Yeah, one is uh, information and furniture, so the uh, system becomes orthogonal um, to its uh, surrounding, creating all different kinds of scale. Yeah, from an urban furniture level up to um, an exhibition or booth level and um, can also create something that uh, completely surrounds you, creates space around you uh, more on a um, pavilion scale and then is applied um, for events and festivals. And the interesting thing about um, having a system that is so simple um, was actually the um, yeah, universal application that it opens up. Yeah, So kind of like um, a democratization um, of the building process itself. So what we developed with our students um, was something like a digital menu. Um, and then what this was later developed into an AR um, application. So basically this was a little bit the precursor of what we did in New York. Yeah, that this time we just showed it um, the other way around that also um, you kind of see that like also theoretical approaches come um, very much into practice, yeah, and also very much function on very different scales. And having this um, system here, it became actually something way more than um, yeah, the, the, the combination of these two parts. Yeah, it became uh, something that uh, can be yeah, sent digitally and uh, universally copied around the world and becomes um, kind of a building kit for everybody, yeah, like that is digital, that is um, um, available um, on your phone. Everybody can get an instruction and only has like two building elements, one local and one global, um, and uh, which, yeah, you can source um, the structures digitally. They will be shown to you um, in an uh, AR environment. Um, and uh, therefore, everybody on site can be the builder, yeah, and all the elements in this are um, kind of reversible. We do not um, get into irreversible material connections with this system. So also um, the pavilion, for example, what you see on the left side can always be reassembled um, to one of the structures you saw before. It can be reassembled to exhibition structures. And this is how like a system, like on the first look, like which is very simple, has the, yeah, has the power actually um, yeah, to like empower everybody to um, be part of this participatory building process. And this is something that we're um, actually striving in our architecture um, very much. Yeah, we've been asked a lot of questions about like um, how um, technological progress, um, AI integration um, has an effect on the architecture and what is the human level um, about this in uh, yeah, the whole process of building. And actually we see this, um, yeah, uh, not only as a tool, but also as a means um, to bring actually people together um, to create um, architecture in a collaborative process. And the architecture itself, um, so to say, steps, uh, steps back yeah, and becomes the system designer or the designer of the framework 
um, that can uh, create helping this empowerment and create helping this um, transformative process in society itself. And of course, um, these systems, we do not uh, apply them in a very, only in a very small scale. Yeah. Um, so in this slide, we make uh, quite of a jump. Yeah, we go from a very small pavilion uh, uh, scale back to something that we had in the New York projects before. Like this is a um, this is a um, tower project uh, we did in China, um, in a city that is uh, located around uh, one hour uh, um, one hour away from Shanghai. Um, this is part of a larger master plan for one Shan. Um, and it's called in Wuxi, uh, or the city is it's called Wuxi. And um, the challenge of this as part of a bigger competition was to create um, like a gateway um, tower um, that becomes uh, kind of like the entrance symbol for the city. And as part of this being entrance symbol, we also wanted to um, show that actually um, these elements we're developing like in a theoretical approach, like prefab modules, um, democratizing timber structures, um, um, being architecture as a social connector, creating like healthy environments, doesn't only work um, on this very small scale, but also um, on a much larger scale. And this is, for example, how then like a project that is developed um, with these uh, uh, values um, or this value system and this methodology in mind um, could end up. So what you see is actually we connect two different parts of a city um, with a unifying uh, um, plinth um, that also goes over, a, yeah, like let's say a, a, a large um, uh, um, a large border in the city. In this in this way, it's like a yeah a, a transport system, yeah, like a big street. So the building itself becomes more like a three-dimensional um, infrastructure element that crosses uh, a certain borders uh, inside um, inside of the urban system. And what was very novel in this approach was, of course, uh, like the project before, um, the use of timber um, in this. Uh, on this slide, you see like a cross section again on the right side, um, how the um, building actually uh, connects like the two parts um, of the city and also the high rises itself um, yeah, forming out of like the urban fabric and making a gesture, um, giving views um, to its um, surrounding. Uh, like one of the uh, buildings is facing actually a natural park that was developed as part of this um, master plan process. The other one uh, goes into the north in a more mountainous um, area, therefore creating very two very unique views um, in these um, yeah in these dancing um, towers. And interesting on the left side, we uh, took out like a cross section here. What you see, this is a timber hybrid construction with a yeah um, concrete cores, um, but um, like a, a, like a, a timber construction uh, system itself. So we um, kind of uh, try to bring together like uh, two construction methodologies, two materials um, to create something um, that is um, yeah in this case also has never been seen before. Yeah, there's a lot of research at the moment in high rise um, timber construction. And this is um, also, of course, with the background um, yeah, of uh, CLT uh, timber and like also the fire protection measurements, technological advances um, that generate the ability um, yeah, for wood or timber um, to actually realize um, something like this. And here you see um, the relation again of the two towers. We have um, in the middle, yeah, the, the um, infrastructure stream and the axis, and um, then how the towers evolve with the modular elements that are prefabricated and stacked on top of each other um, to create this linked um, hybrid typology that on one side, um, so this is the master plan, looks um, over the newly created city and over the nature reserve, and on the other side um, connects um, the northernmost part um, of the area back to the city at the same time creating like something like a gateway um, situation that would be the entrance to this new city development. And this brings us um, to something that is also um, very new for us uh, to present today. Uh, this is a completely new project 
um, we throw in. This is the first time we show it. Um, lately, we have been um, yeah, uh, um, we, we have been researching a lot, but also in our practice um, doing uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of projects that are in timber and something uh, that we also push forward um, in the next year in our projects. And what you see here is um, our uh, Levi um, timber airport system. So this would be the world's first um, airport system and even airport that would be like uh, completely planned with a timber construction. And what makes it so special, we will also um, go through in the next slides, um, because the airport itself, it started um, as a competition um, uh, this year that was also affected by the um, pandemic. So it's also what you see this year is like a lot of projects that change um, in their nature um, in the pandemic and also um, teach us in our practice yeah, how to be resilient and how to adopt to certain situations that we also want to reflect um, in our architecture or that we think our, our architecture um, yeah, can reflect in the way it is planned through um, yeah, these predictive planning uh, methodologies that you've seen also in our academic approach. So this was um, a competition originally uh, meant for the new Innsbruck uh, terminal. Um, after uh, yeah, the, the pandemic struck, the uh, competition itself was cancelled um, and we were also um, left out with um, the idea if we continue this project or not. And we used this actually as a um, yeah, case project um, for our office to create something that is larger than a single airport and accommodate uh, many more um, function that we think an airport would need today. And um, to start with this, one of the things is um, what we often see um, in airports today. There's like a certain, yeah, like let's say monoculture in this or in the function of it. Um, and this is why many of these, um, and this is why many of these um, airports or travel hubs um, become so, something like a non-place, yeah, where actually people are in transit. Um, every airport in the world uh, looks kind of similar or the same, so to say. And um, so also people tend to forget where they are. So it would be also important to foster um, kind of, uh, first of all, a system that encourages like a mix of functions that creates um, identity and also business opportunities inside, um, yeah, inside um, of an airport terminal or inside of the building itself. So this is something um, what we did. Um, the special situation we found um, in this case was actually that um, the airport itself um, had a, it had a very special or very unique uh, um, local identity. It is like in Innsbruck, it's very closely connected um, to the yeah, university buildings as well to many sports facilities. And the airport itself is also in uh, close proximity to the city, um, which gives it a special function, but which we also should in general um, think about how we um, can actually more engage the public um, yeah, into our travel infrastructure and how our travel infrastructure um, can be more engaging for humans, can be more engaging um, for everybody around, yeah, for the uh, local infrastructure as well as for the people um, who are visiting or the people who are traveling. Um, in this case, um, what we created was um, like a public promenade that pinches um, through the whole building and um, it creates kind of a communal plaza that is located on the land side um, of the building um, with yeah like a yeah like a um, yeah informal meeting place where uh, daily life happens and it goes right through through the air side so basically this would be an airport where you can openly uh, go from land side to air side and be connected uh, to the people who arrive or the people who um, depart um, at this space. The interesting thing with this uh, green boulevard that pinches through is also um, the functions that are placed alongside because this is all public functions like a restaurant, uh, uh, like uh, open offices, co-working spaces. And this opens up this system actually for new business model where an airport doesn't uh, necessarily only become a place where uh, uh, something like uh, yeah, shopping uh, happens yeah in the waiting time or it creates uh, uh, 
um, uh, spaces for um, yeah for ads yeah in the time you have to wait but actually that creates something that is way more communal way more social and a place of or like an interface between uh, yeah local and uh, uh, and international um, streams and where they come together and create something that is very unique the whole airport is basically built up on a um, yeah, volumetric voxel um, system, um, which can extend and shrink yeah, to its needs. So um, this is also something that came with the pandemic. We um, started thinking about um, how um, the system of air travel um, can be actually designed to be way more adaptive. Yeah, there will be a lot of changes um, in the air travel of tomorrow. We see it already today. Yeah, there um, like the posts. Yeah, like there will be a lot of planes. Uh, um, stay on the ground, for example. Yeah, there will be a lot less traffic um, at the moment. It can also increase in the future, and we need like actually a system that can manage all of that without tearing down the airports we have and building new ones. Um, and this is something where um, this system um, comes in. In this case, um, with this modular structure, which has just showed, yeah, with this uh, with the setup of uh, spatial. Um, boxes, what you can see here is also a yeah, local element we took um, from the vernacular architecture of Innsbruck. Um, we kind of did a reinterpretation of um, yeah, classical uh, um, buildings there, of roof structures, but gave it like a modern twist um, to house it all under um, one system that is created with um, renewable materials. And here you can also see um, from the design intent um, itself, yeah, um, this airport could also be possible with other roofs. Yeah, in this special case in Innsbruck, we decided um, to create a roof that is uh, similar to something like a mountain hut to create um, on the landslide, uh, on the landside, uh, like a local appearance. And the roof changes into something like a wing structure on the air side, yeah, to give the levity, but also open up the views. Um, inside the airport to the starting airplanes. And this is um, the entrance view um, of this airport. So you see basically the roof structure yeah, that uh, we were just talking about um, that gives uh, not only shelter, yeah, but introduces the interface between um, the travelers, the local people, local institution and creates um, rather than a parking lot and an airport, a communal space where um, open markets can happen that already integrates um, multimodal mobility. The airport is completely designed with its electrical infrastructure to already host um, electric mobility on both sides, yeah, on land side and on air side. Um, it is created with autonomous um, systems in mind that um, actually co-populate um, the spaces um, with the people. Um, so basically, um, coming from the spatial voxels, um, we also extend um, like this idea and the system um, of complete flexibility and ability to transform also to the landscaping um, around uh, the building itself. So the design of the building um, was really driven from the beginning by creating a a construction system. Sorry, could you mute yourself from your set? I'm having a thank you. Um, so we really started with the question, what does our construction system want to respond to? And if you think about airports all around the world, the thing that we think about in every airport is the roof in the end. Like uh, you have kind of, uh, every airport has an identity, but the identity of an airport is always the roof. You think of Beijing, you think of Madrid, every airport is kind of like this, wants to have a large spanning roof that is kind of identity giving. Um, but on the other hand, we wanted to have this much more small scale modular system that really is working on a human scale of having a small pixel crate, very yeah, uh, room scale building system that is modular and interchangeable. So we had kind of these two big elements that is the programmatic requirements and the human scale on the one side and this um, ambition for large span sculptural roof on the other hand that we wanted to bring together. So we created this then, um, 
hybrid as timber construction of a modular system one that is voxel based in a small human scale grid that can be really house different programmatic requirements that change over the course or the lifetime of the airport. Um, and on the other hand, we've got a modular system number two, which accompanies the roof structure and large open spans for large open spaces. And these two structural systems slot into each other. So basically perform on the same grid, but rotated to each other with different spans and different uh, dimensions of parts. So we have the standardized timber construction as a base that kind of allows us a very flexible setup of the spaces underneath. So what Marvin already uh, hinted at, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the entire program, everything that happens underneath the roof of the project is set up as this in the spatial voxel setup, where we really have a completely flexible massing that is independent of the structure, uh, where we basically have a build-up process where we feed uh, our system the, the massing that we came through with our urban analysis and our steps that we explained in the first diagrams at the beginning of how much setback do we want, where do we want open spaces, where do we want closed spaces, and we feed these uh, boundary requirements into our system, and then it basically algorithmically deploys all necessarily structural members within this voxel setup. So um, we basically have a flexibility of completely being able to play and rearrange our programmatic functions within under this one unified roof uh, with the same repeating discrete elements. Um, the whole thing, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the whole thing is constructed as a hybrid construction of CLT and Clulam. Uh, we're using clue laminated timber for the beams and columns and cross laminated timber um, for slabs, walls, etc. So we've got this hybrid system where we can achieve much greater spans and interior flexibility without requiring any thick timber slabs. Um, so it kind of allows us a maximum of open plan and adaptable spaces within a standardized uh, construction system. Um, all of these, if you go on the next slide, please. All of these spaces were really thought about as being something like a modular travel infrastructure, like a universal, universal applicable kit of parts um, that is designed with all reversible connections. So there's no fixed member connections, but every connection is the fit outs, the construction, the furnishing, uh, fit out floors, walls, MVP, cladding is all reversible and kind of is designed for uh, disassembly from the beginning. So it has this full sustainable production chain um, mixed with the reversible connections that really allows us spatial robustness and long material cycles uh, and optimized building processes over the course of the project, depending on what is needed. So we've got this kit of parts. So we develop basically a universal kit of parts. Um, and if you go on the next slide, please. That can then be applied or deployed to something that we call the flexible space on demand. So areas in the airport can be activated when they need it. Gates can be extended via switchable with swing gates. And we can have whole areas in the airport that can be increased horizontally or vertically. So everything in the design is completely built on prefabricated units. And it kind of allows for a super high degree of freedom and technical installations and finish within the construction. Um, if you go on the next slide, um, this entire system was not only designed or thought about for what is the usage or the programmatic requirements, but we really want to design uh, well a CO2 neutral transport hub where the entire construction process is planned from the sustainable managed forest to how can we automatize and unitize uh, fabrication and manufacturing processes? What parts of the system can be, can be prefab and just installed and plugged in on site? And which parts that need to be assembled on site can be standardized as much as possible to make this a really, yeah, a simplified plug and play system of construction. Um, this prefab also gives us extremely high level of finish and the possibility of integrate a lot of MEP and a lot of the house technique already in the building from the moment where we fabricate it. Um, and then the whole idea was also that 
we can disassemble it. Yes, we can rearrange it, but we can also, in case it isn't parts of the system are not needed anymore, uh, through our use of timber materials, most of the material can be upcycled after usage and go back into, um, yeah, a fully uh, circular building material system. Um, if you go on the next slide, please. This kind of this idea of a circular building or holistic planning processes tickles through our construction and use of material, but also what we understand as holistic planning in general. And this is like on the one hand, it's the integration of sustainable materials and CUT neutral fabric uh, manufacturing, but it's also the creation of healthy environments, green environments, healthy indoor climate, um, activity-based program, giving this extra program that you normally don't have in an airport, um, mixed with flexible spaces and also important for us when talking about a universal system, every time when you have a universal system, it's important for us that we also give the space for identity, branding, and individualization. So it doesn't become a generic made fit all solution or made to order, but it is really a system that can be highly customized uh, in appearance and in program, um, like Mark mentioned before, in massing, using different roof systems that work within the same structural grid and within the same modular setup. Um, so, I think what was important that these values tickle through from really a small scale construction detail to an overall, uh, yeah, holistic planning approach that we had to the entire building. Um, if you go on the next slide, please. Um, and that this construction system really incorporates a lot of solutions, not just on the scale of, of the building scale and how do we fabricate this, how do we manufacture, but really also into the how do we as humans interact with this building at the end? And what part of uh, design challenges can be integrative into this building system? And that can really range from, I mean, we have this construction sequence, but this human scale interfaces, uh, anything from information display, wayfinding, embedded lighting directly into the system, um, an MEP that is runs through the hollow cross uh, columns that we have in the system. So we really looked at how can we create a universal building system, but that is not just the industrial architecture of building warehouses, but that really has also human interfaces and human scale elements embedded in the planning and design process. Um, if you go on the next slide, please. So here you see kind of the departure hall and the spatial qualities that we can achieve. Uh, within this building systems in the case of the Innsbruck Airport and how we originally envisioned it for uh, for the competition before uh, the whole world turned upside down a little bit. But uh, it's really showing this, I think, human scale spatial qualities, the possibility of creating very different from small scale enclosed spaces to large span open spaces for departure halls. So having, creating these different spatial qualities, but cre also creating this really warm and uh, inviting uh, interfaces on a human level to interact and to, to use the building. Um, and this is one use case scenario. And if you look at the next slide, this is kind of a development how we imagine this programmatic flexibility to play out over the course of the year, like really providing the spatial flexibility where the airport can adapt in 10 years time. What happens if, I mean, there, there's, political and global developments that influence the way how we travel and how we use the world uh, that we can't predict. So we can't predict these developments, but we can predict how we plan our buildings so they can respond to them. Um, these are simple things in terms of air travel where we've got a clear separation, what is Schengen, what is not Schengen, what is EU, what is not EU. And then a country like the UK decides, oh, we're not the EU anymore after hundreds of years. And how do airports respond to this? If all of a sudden there's shifts in how do we travel? What security requirements do we have for what travel happen? Um, so we really believe that especially traveling, which is such a dynamic uh, process or such a dynamic activity needs to be able to have an infrastructure that is as dynamic as the act of traveling itself. Um, so that was our little sneak into uh, how we kind of steered uh, a wild competition that went upside down into something that we thought 
turn it into something much bigger and more interesting over the course of the competition. Um, and it kind of expands to, in general, the way how we work. If we work on something very project specific, we are, we are always interested in expanding it to something that has kind of a more universal systemic appeal or the systemic idea thinking behind it, like something that is more more collaborative and more circular in its thinking than just one finite um, yeah, massing proposal or building proposal. Marvin, you muted. And also, um, like seeing this uh, um, participatory process or like the special circumstances, how this uh, project um, evolved. Yeah, it was um, a collaborative uh, process that we did um, in this one. Um, also gave us like a lot of feedback on our work modes itself. And this is also something that we quickly wanted to introduce um, at the end of the presentation. Maybe you saw it on the slides before already. Um, the airport was uh, uh, done in collaboration with um, um, yeah, a befriended uh, studio we have. It's called uh, Gratvis. And um, we started to have like a strategic um, partnership um, with this office um, to not only um, create uh, yeah, spatial innovation, that is something that is very close to our hearts, but also bring this into um, reality in architecture that is, or in urbanism that is transformative that um, not only changes with us, but also um, changes um, us in a positive way. And this is how we um, now created um, kind of like the setup that you see on this um, slide here. Um, it's kind of like a little ecosystem in itself that goes from um, project development to um, um, concept design yeah, and vision um, to realization of the projects. Um, and it's part of um, yeah, the collaboration um, between uh, Gradvis, between us. Um, um, we are working since one and a half year um, on a yeah, very social project. Um, this in collaboration with the um, Stadtmission, uh, with the Berlin City Mission. Um, and this is something you see here just as a teaser image. Um, this is our vision. Um, for um, yeah, collective living or um, for a more participatory development um, of neighborhoods. And um, the whole idea of this is um, that we create um, temporary neighborhoods um, that are also designed with a participatory approach um, with the people um, who live there, um, but are on a maximum for five years, which uses uh, kind of, um, yeah, kind of, I would not say loophole, yeah, but uh, uses kind of like um, the building industry and the time it takes to uh, ready up um, a plot um, to create value on a plot. Um, and this is maybe not only economic value in this case, but also, um, a, yeah, like a means to create social value on um, urban plots where uh, um, that um, are empty, yeah, or that stand empty and that are not used in the city. Um, to create something that reintegrates um, homeless people back into society uh, as part of like a, a mixed uh, neighborhood system um, we create. Um, we call this Urban Beta. And uh, we are also very happy to announce um, that we're at the moment um, in the funding process of the Zukunft Bau. Um, the German government found this very interesting, this approach. So this is something we will um, develop also participatory with um, our partners um, that you saw yeah, with Gradvis, with um, Urban Beta together into, um, yeah, hopefully um, from a research project into a product um, that uh, we also hope will have um, a positive um, impact um, how we yeah, develop our neighborhoods. Yeah? And yeah, with this, um, we're at the end of our presentation and um, yeah, we hope it was uh, enjoyable and we also hope it gave you um, an insight. It was a little bit of a different presentation that we usually do. Um, it's maybe a little bit more personal and a little bit more looking um, behind the scenes um, in our methodology. And we're very curious um, now on the yeah, Q&A that's following up or on the questions that arise during the presentation. And uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, thanks so much to both of you. That was awesome. Um, we do have a million questions waiting for you. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to start. Um, so I actually have a question about your, your modular timber airport um, that you're using glue and framing and CLT panels. Um, from my understanding, airports have very strict regulations uh, as far as protective design, you know, fire design, progressive collapse, that kind of thing. Uh, just because of the nature of airports, you know, they're central, uh, they're pretty heavily crowded under normal circumstances uh, with people, with goods, with that kind of thing. Uh, so while you guys were developing this project, did you get the impression that timber is a viable material for airport design? Because the benefits in terms of sustainability and material reuse are very significant and it's pretty amazing. Um, so do you think that's enough to make it competitive with conventional like steel, concrete kind of thing? Um, I, I I think, or like I, maybe I start and Paul continues um, on, on my answer to this, um, because like some of the parts you already uh, um, already mentioned, we do think that uh, um, timber construction is um, the future of building. Yeah, just in, <laughs> very like out there right now. Um, but um, um, to say this, um, this only just this idea of having a full timber air airport. Um, it would not be possible like uh, um, 10 years ago or something like this. So this comes at a certain moment. Um, this comes at a certain moment in time when like technological development reaches a certain state in um, yeah, maybe formerly disconnected fields. And like there's a, a lot of research been going on, is, especially with, uh, with CLT um, timber. And this is why it's also on the rise um, at the moment, uh, like in high rise construction or in towers. Um, and this has a lot to do with this. Uh, um, uh, this has a lot to do with uh, fire regulations, uh, um, actually. Uh, um, and um, the interesting fact is actually like the, the glue laminated uh, timber we can like uh, um, fabricate today has actually better uh, uh, um, fire protection. Um, how you say that? Uh, uh, like it burns down much more controlled, for example, than a steel concrete. Um, construction because in, in, in steel concrete, it's uh, like also with the mix of materials and steel is almost impossible to completely calculate. So basically you will um, al always oversaturate the thing and, and like how timber burns down is very calculated. So there has been like a lot of uh, uh, um, tests and especially over the last 10 years with this new building uh, um, methodology um, using CLT or, or massive timber constructions that actually something like an airport does become possible today. Yeah. And this is also why we do not see so many airports that are built in, in timber today. So it's also why this field um, kind of also interests us. Yeah. As you see, maybe in the presentation, maybe we don't want to repeat uh, um, necessarily what has been done uh, before. Yeah. And um, always um, kind of also push, push a little uh, or like, like this. Um, yeah, physical possibilities and regulatory possibilities to the limit. It's also something what we do in our um, urban beta project. Yeah, like the government said, for example, that it's so interesting. Uh, um, like they, they said, like the, the topic you have is so interesting because um, we have like a little hole in the German law about um, uh, bringing housing and temporary construction together. Yeah. And all of this is also envisioned like in a, in a like um, timber framework. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're very happy actually um, to advance um, with this building material um, in, the, in the future. I think what's really important is to think of it as a, um, yeah, uh, um, as a material bank or like a deco instead of, uh, um, instead of a building, like a building that is uh, um, only has fixed connections that you cannot uh, um, retrieve the material anymore because like we have to think um, of this and this also comes uh, with this uh, like questions of uh, renewable materials for example yeah we have to build our buildings more um, with non-fixed uh, uh, connections having like a circular economy model in mind because uh, um, for example if we manage to build up something like a a material data bank where we create a value chain systems that is based around materials and not based around um, other facts. Yeah, suddenly like an airport like this uh, could also become something how value is actually created instead of decreased like we have in many buildings today. Where, like you could see it, for example, like many buildings today, you cannot 
break apart the like steel concrete construction. So like your building becomes more like a mine for materials. Yeah. Like where you have to, uh, urban mine, uh, like, um, like the, 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 the parts out you want to recycle later. And all of this takes a lot of energy and this has to be thought of. Yeah. Like um, we can recycle many materials today, but the energy it's taking, that's always uh, like uh, people are a little quiet about that. Yeah. Um, and this is something that um, a system like this has, I think, in mind or um, or something like our um, office agenda in general, yeah, tries to um, pursue. Yeah, maybe just about your uh, question about security and safety. Um, I think it's one of the a question that we in many things always end up with. Uh, is is something safe uh, or is something possible to implement today? Um, and I mean, a lot of our projects, we kind of looking, I guess, at usually the technical advances are like a few years ahead in every development. It's like if we talk about mobility or autonomous mobility, which was a big topic for us also over the last few years, and it, now it's constructing in timber. What is possible technically is usually 10 years ahead of what is allowed to do. And that's kind of the recurring like that's true. Pol policies, building regulations are usually, I would say, five to 10 years behind to what is actually possible. So the concern is not so much in with all the advances that have been happened in CLT in the last few years. Is it, is it safe and secure to build? It's more in which countries under which building code what can you do basically and where can you what do you need to respond to what do you need to ban to be allowed to do this and that in under which building laws um yeah. and we are very optimistic that eventually uh yeah they will all they all just need a different timing of adapting to it yeah. but that's well, the more I'm, limiting factor of them that's a that's a good point I'm, my, my question was as a coming from a structural engineer you know we always get this huge ambitious project from an architect. And then I have to be the one to deliver the bad news of, no, we're actually not allowed to do this. <laughs> yeah, no, um, we, we've had intense conversation with a structural engineer about this as well. And I think the general consensus was, it's it's not a, can we do it, but are we allowed to do it? I yeah. think that's more the, the question. It's, it's, it's not the technical feasibility. But yeah, even yeah. with today's, uh, as climate change becomes more important and material scarcity, you know, th those kinds of discussions are finally in the spotlight where they should have been for this whole time, probably. Uh, maybe we can finally start putting equal emphasis on cost time as we do on, you know, environmental uh, criteria. All right. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me well now? Yep. Yes. Perfect. I'm sorry about my uh, technical issues. Um, I actually received a nice lineup of really interesting questions from the participants. So um, just please continue sending me questions. And guys, everyone, cameras on, don't be shy. Uh, so we can start the more informal um, part of the, of the meeting. Um, and the first question I received came from Aya Youssef. And it's a question on the use of augmented reality uh, in your practice. So, uh, Aya, I'm, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, so, I have a question concerning the AR that uh, you talked about. How can you take this AR application to the community's advantage? Um, as in, probably it may be a revolutionary tool in architecture, at least in my point of view, especially post COVID-19. So, um, I, I think a lot of times when we start using new technologies, um, we kind of, we go through the same timeline of a certain curiosity in the studio about testing out new technologies, I would say. So it always starts in a, in a very playful way uh, to a degree where we basically we want to explore what is the limitations, what is the possibility, and this is where the academic uh, surrounding that we have is ideal for where we can really test these new things. So in this case, it was really more about using a what we've been showing at the AA visiting school in New York. It was really about this using AR as a tool of communication, right, of exchanging ideas, of sharing designs, of sharing. Uh, 
yeah, ideas about our urban environment in a wider context and how how can we experience how can we experience virtual things, but also how can we experience the same thing if we're not physically present at the same. So I think this was something that was really exciting for us. Um, but then we also we really saw the potential in using these AI applications of being applied in in a real project and you, it's and seeing it as a really strong tool to communicating ideas and visualizing ideas in a way with people that are actually not technologically savvy. So I think this is also uh, a connection that for us is really interesting. What is the use case of a technology when it is really cutting edge and is probably only of interest for a small group of people that are really invested in these new developments and that are willing to invest a lot of money uh, into into using these new technologies and when is the case when do we can when can we make it participatory and when can we give it to the public and when can we involve what are the ways i think this is when technology becomes interesting for us to be used in in our studio work or in our professional work um, so the case of ar i think is a very specific example where over the last few years you can already see how it uh, I remember when the first Microsoft HoloLenses were up for beta testing and it was a lot of money and you could register for it and good friends of ours built a pavilion in Tallinn using the technology um, kind of as a great use case uh, for how to use it in construction. It was the Tallinn, Tallinn pavilion last year um, by Sumin Han and Igor Pantic together with Pologram and they they used it as a, in a real case scenario of really building with this HoloLens but using it as a tool to uh, standardize construction sequences where everybody basically had augmented reality in front of them and was able to build using this as kind of the blueprint for construction. So this was kind of going from academic research into reality. And then in the last, only over the last few months, I mean, this is a field that is really developing week to week, right? It's not a field where we say there's an advantage in five years, but things that I talk about now that we were doing six months ago are already outdated in a way. Uh, so since a few months, there's a way more publicly accessible way of really using this AR application on your phone for everyone. And this is all of a sudden was for us a break where now this becomes interesting to think of use cases. How can we implement it in our actual day to day work and how can we use it to visualize things? Uh, for developers and clients. So at the moment, in the case of the AR, we are talking to AR developers uh, for our um, beta project. Um, and the idea is kind of to maybe use this digital tool to empower socially disadvantaged people to take part in the process of building and creating themselves. So it's kind of this increase of computational power and the decrease of costs of buying into the technology uh, where in every group there's a certain accessibility to a smartphone is something that we can use uh, to help democratizing this building process. So it's anything from free digital manuals, DIY kits of building that can be built with using augmented reality can kind of lead to creation of shared ownership, shared property and participatory building. So I think this is really a topic where we see, I mean, it's a huge jump in application from something that is very playful and experimental where we see real world application, but we really think these are technologies that once they can be in the hands of everyone can really foster or encourage participation of people. And maybe just, I, I've nothing to add, you know, but just maybe um, to, to have like one little thing that we're maybe trying with the urban beta um, project is also because there's a, huge step also because like we we saw like the development of hologram yeah and like now they're uh, going into the construction industry yeah like kind of a company can buy the hololens and like the construction work can have it on and it um, improves their improves their uh, um, efficiency um which is a very good thing and what we're at like at this uh, crossroads at the moment for just what paul said um where, where we're like how can we um, pull this even like in a like yeah like in a in a group like of where it's like maybe more social demanding or something like this yeah where not maybe everybody has uh, the hololens yeah maybe we can have a shared cell phone or something and how can we um, create rather 
um, ecosystem around this technology um, that is new and makes it more accessible in a way. And uh, part also what Paul said is like there are these certain these kits of parts and uh, um, uh, um, kind of like shared models, participatory models, uh, DIY kits, yeah, the, the the menu like or like digital menu or something, everything that like connects kind of like physical and digital together. Um, and it's all great, but it's like I, I like personally, I'm very interested at the moment in this in this process how to uh, um, how to bring it uh, um, into yeah like uh, um, uh, into other social groups yeah, uh, and that's what we're following with Urban Beta um, at the moment how we can bring actually this power of building or actually creating. Uh, value or property for people who are um, usually um, not, um, yeah, in the in the, uh, um, uh, who are usually not in the yeah, social position to do that, yeah, and to empower um, these people. And we have a very strong partner with this in the Berlin City Mission. Um, and I think, or basically, I hope this will be our research uh, next year. If further, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Damian. Damian, I, I, I know you have a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the great presentation. I'm a great fan of your works, as you know. So it was very inspiring to, to hear uh, and to see your new project. I was wondering, because you mentioned um, that there are some kind of limitations when it comes to, uh, for example, legal limitations. But I was wondering if are there any limitations when it comes to infrastructure, for 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 example, to infrastructure to implement all these interesting visions of connectivity between, uh, you know, the ground for the Internet of Things, etc. So uh, one th thing I was thinking about was, uh, for example, 5G networks. Uh, which promises are the better connectivity between uh, things, between uh, the, the, the Internet of Things. So are there any other obstacles when it comes to infrastructure? Uh, always. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still, I mean, this is like a huge field that's, that's opening up right now because um, the, the, the first part when you were starting about the question, I was uh, like more like uh, um, thinking of like the, the phys physical uh, boundaries, yeah, like starting from construction site management, yeah, to actually uh, uh, building up uh, kind of like a ecosystem around um, circular economy use cases, yeah, or building up kind of like a material database, yeah, that is uh, somehow applied uh, worldwide or Europe wide or something like this. And, um, I mean, to, to be honest, I mean there are <laughs> there are a lot, yeah, and there's a there's a lot of uh, opportunities and, and, and challenges to work on. Um, for me personally, I, maybe I, I point out rather something that uh, impresses us uh, at the moment, and we had like a talk about this uh, uh, on last Wednesday, I think. Uh, um, uh, um, I think we're very impressed by uh, uh, the European Union and Ursula von der Leyen's statement about. Uh, creating a European uh, Bauhaus that is uh, completely uh, um, uh, um, focused on on like this uh, circular approach yeah? and like also renewable materials and like how we can create kind of like from a, a, um, a very one way society uh, um, that we live in right now to something that is thought way more circular where we can give back materials where we actually have maybe something like a, a material database. Um, we're maybe interested in, um, and that's what we talked about. Actually, how, uh, um, and this is maybe not not, not how how only like a, a physical manifestation of this new Bauhaus, for example, could look like. But like, what is this when you? I mean, I think this is so interesting. Yeah, if you extend the topic from uh, something that evolved in Germany in the in the twenties, but now uh, kind of like we have to come across uh, like borders. Yeah. Also something, yeah. Like even in between nations, I think this is a limitation we have, and this is uh, getting um, also in a political sense at the moment, not so easy. Um, and, and I think this was a great statement, like of uh, maybe at, at least maybe the EU, yeah, holding together and like overcoming, um, overcoming some of them uh, and um, using the Corona bonds to build something up that is actually more um, something that helps in a long-term relationship and in, in the end of the day construction 
the, the, the you know CO2 footprint of construction is one of the largest um, uh, um, relatively to all the others um, in the world. So it's also one of the first topics we have to tackle. Um, and I think announcements like this um, are a great way to overcome at least some of these <laughs> limitations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Damian. Um, we have the next question from Martina. Martina, I'm unmuting you. Feel free um, to. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you about something you said on the very beginning. Uh, you said that a classical house with a garden is very not efficient, but I also think it's kind of everyone's dream. So, what's your vision about it? I, I don't think it's necessarily <laughs> the house with the garden that is not. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's not everyone. But I think everyone has different dreams. <laughs> I'm also not sure. I think, about it's a, I think it is a completely <laughs> valid dream to have. Um, let's put it like this. And I think there is absolutely space for that dream. I, don't, I also don't think that it was about the. It's less a comment about the program of the classical house with a garden, it's more about the attitude to construction and to infrastructure and to planning that uh, that kind of revolves around it. I think it is, it's not a critique of the typology of the single house. I think it is more a critique on this, this planning of you build your single home and then you use it and then it gets torn apart and it all goes to waste and it doesn't it doesn't adapt to change. I think this is some, um, it's it's the planning principles that I see critical um, of planning something just for consumption and eventual uh, dismantling and destruction in a way. Mixed with the field that even the classical house, it, yeah, I, I don't know, I was, when we, when we were in Ecuador, actually a really interesting thing was all the single homes, uh, at the beginning, I was wondering in the first few weeks, why are the rebar, uh, like all the construction sticking out of the first floor? So all the homes had literally like reconstruction materials sticking out of the roof. And then we asked uh, the dean of the university that invited us after a few weeks, um, how come that every single building looks like beautifully done at the bottom, but then has these construction materials sticking out of the roof? And the reason is, uh, in a lot of South American countries, you have the dream of building your single home, but you also know that your family is going to grow. And it is also much more common than in, say, European um, countries that the grandparents live together with the children. So every time there's a new generation of the family, they basically already know that they will have to tear down the roof and build another floor on top. So from the beginning, they already built this construction embedded into it that they can react to it. And I think this is kind of what we see, what I thought was a really inventive uh, hacking of the, the single home dream in a way of giving this possibility of adapting and growing uh, later in the future. So it's less about the idea of living with your family in a home with a garden, but it's about the idea of planning from the beginning to be uh, to be able to respond to change in the in the years. I could also, like, I, I have to add something about the typology itself. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, because I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, definitely valid, yeah, to have a garden or to own a house in a certain extent or something like this. But what we really have to think about is when, when it comes to my mind, yeah, this type of, and this is why we also showed it like this, yeah, because it has this classical. Uh, uh, image of the suburban house, yeah, somewhere. Um, um, and and the, the the thing is, I, personally, I think this typology itself is not super ecological because, like, the more dense we get, the more uh, like ecological our buildings get. Yeah, like living in the countryside is not the most ecological thing we can do uh, to our planet. It's actually densification. Yeah, but done right. Um, but to to see that, I think the slide it it should also illustrate in a way. That we um, like because usually the stereotype comes with this typology of like the house and maybe not the garden but the fence around the garden yeah and this is something that um, uh, um, I'm, I don't like so much about the typology itself because it's more about seclusion yeah and having your own property um, and maybe also something that we want to tackle with this collective uh, neighborhoods uh, um, in the urban beta project um, because we really 
want to start uh, thinking from the project development approach. Yeah, and there are also very good models in German history, uh, um, like developed, for example, by Ex Rotaprint or uh, um, uh, um, other institutions that are um, more collectively based. Yeah, and all that of that was actually evolving after um, after uh, um, the Second World War in Germany, and we have like a really interesting systems. It's called like Erbpachtverträge and uh, systems how uh, people can actually uh, um, be able to create uh, a property on themselves and leasing models, uh, how to evaluate this. And I think it's all, always not about looking at the single house with the fence and with the garden around, but like what happens with your neighbor? Where is your neighbor? How do you communicate with it? Or what can you share um, in the future? Yeah, And it's also like a very interesting topic um, with the pandemic at the moment. Yeah. Um, um, I think it was written down in one of the questions as well, because like our, our, also our shared economy is uh, is getting maybe a refought yeah, at the moment. So, um, um, yeah, so just some thoughts about the typology of the single family house. <laughs> I mean, I think there's something new at the moment, especially also during the pandemic, where a lot of people are escaping the city. There's an interesting new typology of this idea of the single house together with the living standards of living in a city that clashes together and i think that actually yes i mean we talk about this a lot there's a lot of new typologies of co-villages and these kind of things that are starting where people don't necessarily live in the densest densest uh, part of the city with overpressed rent but have space but also have a very different attitude of living uh, of being sharing space and sharing infrastructure and so on. So where there's a lot of facilities that you can share while still having the space and amenities of living slightly outside the city, but just not this thought model of what's mine is mine and what's outside of my fence is none of my business. I think it's really about uh, reinterpreting this typology in a way. Actually, just a quick follow up to to what you guys just said. Um, so, do you do you see it more as a problem of, um, from what I'm from what I understand, it's more of a problem with consumer society or consumerism, single use kind of thing, where mm -hmm. yeah, you build your house for now and for your use. But I also, just think I think there's a lot like in general, our society has changed a lot where ownership means much less than probably to the generation before us, right? Like this idea of pro private ownership has tremendously gone down. Like this, I think the idea of I own my car and my car is kind of is who I am has changed so much in our generation where the openness to sharing models, sharing models of cars, sharing models of everything that you own. I don't have a record collection at home because I don't need to own music to enjoy music. I think these are all things that kind of go through all parts of our way of consuming and living and also in the way how we live. And if you live in, I mean, if you live in, say, a city like New York, you're forced economically to share things because you can't, just can't afford to have all the space and all the amenity yourself. But I think, I don't know, I've got a two-sided way where I think there are really advantage in it, but it needs to be a conscious, a conscious sharing model. It should not be a, a compromise out of, our generation can't afford to have some of these amenities and right. own anymore, but it yeah. should be a, an, a voluntarily model of sharing, which I think are two very different things. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank doing you. it intentionally will probably be better anyway. Yeah. But it's also doing it intentionally <laughs> gives control basically to the right people in a way. Right. But but this is also something like like you like you can easily track something like this down how government funding is distributed like uh, and and usually like construction and housing industry is one of the last because it's like the slowest moving industry with like a, a high risk management in the end of the day and it's kind of similar to like a healthcare I think because and and this is why these two industries are somehow very small. Um, moving, but what you see, like also what Paul mentioned, I think is super interesting. Yeah, like we have the comparison to uh, music, movies, yeah, uh, 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 whatever, yeah, platforms that are out there, like uh, from uh, Uber, yeah, kind of to on-demand models or something like this. And this, this will like now, and now we're at the point where this slowly comes into 
um, the building industry, yeah, or, or like the real estate development. And like, I think this is a very interesting time to live in. Thank you. Good, good question. Very, very thought provoking. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, we have the next question from uh, Sarah. She has asked me to read her message on her behalf um, because she's not able to connect. Um, so here it is. At first, as the leader of the project team, I would like to thank you for your willingness to participate in our PBL project of the modification of Klebańska Street in Gliwice, uh, Silesia in Poland. It will be valuable and important experience for us, young architects and urbanists. But let's go to the question. I'd like to know what you think about experimental urbanism, prototyping and use of temporary solutions for public spaces and how, in your opinion, uh, these techniques can work with space and people uh, can relate to our project uh, in situations when the Plebańska Street is already in progress of changes started by its inhabitants and daily users. Um, sorry, could I just summarize the question? It's how can we use um, these technologies in a on an urban? Yeah, it's a, it's a long question. So I, I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's very. It's, I was I was a little unclear about this about the street. Right. What's this? Uh, so first, first question is: What's your opinion uh, about experimental urbanism? Uh, mm -hmm. prototyping in using temporary solutions to public spaces. I and think... Then, um, I, go ahead. Or, um, like, I mean, like, experimental urbanism is a very, very general uh, um, thing to answer now, because I think what you see in our projects, maybe, for example, in this, uh, in, in the AA visiting school, like, this is, I think this is ex experimental urbanism, yeah, and also this fact of... Uh, um, prototyping is very much in there, even though this is not like a, a physical prototype. Yeah, it's not tested to failure or something like this, but it's more like an AR uh, based prototype. And um, just with the notion of this, yeah, and with the no like uh, with the pandemic and everything happened, like um, I think this is already like I think it shows itself already, like the relevance it has, like or, or, or the or the power um, prototyping and also experimental things can have. Yeah, like. And, that, and that's the thing, like, if, like, I think it's super important because you have to, um, it's not, it's sometimes not so important that this gets realized, yeah, but it opens a discussion uh, um, on, on, many, on many different, on many different levels. And I think that's also what we um, try to foster in this, in the, in the academic um, landscape, because we, we rather believe like in, in pluralistic models, yeah, of, of, of co-creation, co of co-design or something like that. Um, and therefore, I think it's, it's it's very important in general, yeah, and something we try to actively uh, participate in. The urban scale, urban is also something that we, of course, are uh, super interested in as it is. We're interested in these bottom-up processes and nowhere else do you see bottom-up processes as much as on an urban scale where uh, the usage of urban public space is defined by, well, the usage of its people and how it's even even if the construct is static, the way how it is used is in a way dynamic. And I think what while well, our experimental urbanist projects are really interested in adding some of this dynamism of usage into the actual physical manifestation of urban space and how is it planned, how is it built, how is it repurposed in a way. And also, and also creating this feedback loop, yeah, like, because um, I think this is, for example, a good platform, yeah, we shared some of these things and we get into this Q&A uh, in, in a process, and this is also like a, a very good means for us to develop our stuff further. Um, so I think it's very important um, to get this as well. All right. Uh, thank you. Just a question, uh, Sarah, would you like to join, um, join us on audio um, if you have any follow-up questions to Marvin and Paul? Okay. Uh, I also received mm -hmm. one question from Victoria. 
um, she wasn't uh, she wasn't able to connect uh, with Ari as well. So I'm going to read her question. Uh, she said, uh, "Hi, I'm fascinated fascinated by by these ideas. Everything sounds great. Uh, my question is, why are innovations so important to you? Innovations are often big challenges, and how how do you convince the society or investors to um, to take up new challenges? What experience do you have? Um, is it mostly good? Well, <laughs> um, um, yeah. Um, okay, I think uh, I, I think the the participation in innovation um, is only feasible if we tackle real life problems. Yeah, and I, I hope I hope that's also clear that like for example with projects like the airport or urban beta yeah um, this this tackles actually something um that has economic value and that has a lot to do with uh, um with uh yeah shift of of value gen systems in, in in general yeah and also this needs to have like a certain future prediction and like maybe also a, like a, a bit of uh, self confidence yeah where we will be in the future um but in the end of the day, if you have to, for example, convince your investors, you always have to convince them of the return of investment. And this has a lot to do. Yeah. So basically what we try is to ground our uh, um, systems in something that is, um, for example, based on a circular economy model, a material database, yes, based on um, uh, um, economic economic values as well yeah like we live in this like capitalist society and like i think we have to uh, play very well in the system like also to get somewhere so um and i think to get somewhere is only innovation yeah in the end of the day because uh, um um i mean there's, there's actually no way around it yeah <laughs> because um it, like in in free market society you will be o always overrun for with the guys who do the most innovation yeah and we don't want to be the ones who uh, at one moment create this monopoly and slow down uh, this innovative process and then um, you know like look two days later um, that somebody else did it already so um, a lot of this process i think is also being about open-minded um, looking left and right yeah um, and uh, seeing what's happening in the field based on discussion and as everything like we said before like also like on pluralistic models and also models of sharing Got it. Thank you. So just just to circle back to Sarah's question, a second part of her question, how experimental urbanism uh, methods can be implemented in the Plebinska Street um, project. Uh, I'm going to um, ask Damian to just give us a, a you know, a quick um, breakdown of, of what the project is about, just so we are we're all um, informed. Uh, Damian, okay. OK, thank you. Uh, so just to clarify, because uh, um, is the Plebańska project and the PBL project, which we uh, on which we collaborate with Salesian University and uh, and, and Sarah, for, for example, as, as the leader of the group of students, which will be working on on, on that street, and we invited Martin and Paul to join the, the whole project as uh, the experts. So. At the moment, actually, I think that we uh, are not able to go into details of this particular project because we we just have to start working on it. But I just want, want to say that it will be uh, very interesting and uh, inspiring to, to see this uh, way of thinking about design and uh, urban design in general, which you presented uh, a moment ago. And, and I'm very curious about uh you know how we can implement these ideas uh together with you as the tutors and experts of this group of students uh, while working on this project yeah no we were <laughs> looking forward to okay it's gonna be already curious <laughs> <laughs> also for us a little spoiler probably now <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thank you thank you damian uh, actually, there's one question that I would like to ask you. Uh, I got really interested um, with your, your project um, on urban mobility. So those um, single single person uh, vehicles that, that looked super cool. 
and I was thinking, you know, in the last few years, we, we observed that um, carpooling, ride sharing, you know, the, uh, public transport is, is suddenly becoming more and more popular as people are trying to go more green. Uh, but now, due to the pandemic, um, everyone's uh, everyone's turning to you know biking or or using a personal car. Um, so it's it's all reversing back to to the fifties or, or the last century. Um, and I was wondering how how do you how do you see the future of of mainstream transportation now in the coming decades, considering. Um, factors like affordability and sustainability and maybe also resilience in, in terms of future pandemics if, if something like that arises or or if this one never goes away right so we, we have no clue what's going to happen so, like I, I mean like the like the first part of the question with uh, um the or recent rise of more personal mobility. I think we also have a very different scenarios than back in the days, because it's something that is more based on, let's say, a diversification of the modes of transport. Yeah, I think it's not only the car, but you see like scooters, bikes. Yeah, like there are different. There are different. There, there are so many different leasing models for bikes out there now at the moment. Yeah. Um, and and I think and and this comes uh, with, with something else I think because this comes with uh, um, like a combination of like technical advances also in different fields that haven't been uh, uh, before like so that's also not why we're coming back because we have like um, GPS tracking software yeah we have smaller sensor technology we have digital payment system we have communication software in the ad market digital market models that go along with these leasing systems yeah so there are different different models of value generations like incorporated in this that only make basically this this street scooters for example possible yeah um so there's so many different innovations that suddenly come together at a certain point yeah and create uh, like what we have uh, um, today at this micro mobility or diversification um Ability. So, and I think this is a big, I think, first of all, this is a big uh, difference to what we had um, um, before. And um, uh, like, I, I don't know, like, because also in Berlin, like, we still have, a, for example, I think that the, the shared economy is working very well uh, um, here. Like, one example would be we have something called the Bear König. It's a little stage name, um, but it's a... Uh, um, it's basically a highly individualized public uh, transport system. Yeah, it's a, it's somewhere in between a taxi uh, and a, and a public bus. It brings you to uh, um, it brings you to your location, but it's a shared uh, it's a shared ride hauling system. Yeah, but that catches you where you are um, and brings you where you are, or uh, calculates the tracks in between and then brings you somewhere in the middle or something like this. And um, I think these systems um, will be um, on the rise. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the shared economy will be as well. Of course, we have a certain setback um, at the moment, but I think this will not hinder the technology in, in progressing um, because like also, I think it would rather foster uh, methods how we can share, but with also having our private space, because this is a large discussion, I think as well, like how, how, how much are we willing to share? Like, and, and this is like a continued negotiation, maybe like we had this in the question before, like also about the house and the fence uh, or something yeah? in um, uh, not in mobility, but in, in building. Um, and yeah, and I, and, and I, and I think it's, it's just more uh, creating possibilities uh, um, to further elaborate, um, to further elaborate on these questions. And, and what we had, for example, like the project we had in mobility, this was this like Gemini project we did at the uh, TU Munich uh, in 2011. Yeah, 2011, <laughs> I think it was. And um, the, I, I think from the most interesting aspect of the whole project was actually that it created the, not 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 only the means of, of transport itself, but uh, um, it was this small storage unit that has become something like a um, assisted living unit. So basically, uh, sharing the energy of the uh, car with the energy of your house. So basically, with the smart grid. So it's creating kind of like a loop, um, um, and also business models where energy becomes like uh, shared 
And also, like, because we talked a lot about value generations and new methodologies and methods to do that. Um, and also, this was like part of this innovation process that could become something uh, and to yeah to talk to investors too yeah because uh, there's a certain economic aspect um, behind that and also like a linking aspect and linking your house uh, to your car your car becomes the shared model yeah your house is also part uh, it was created in Singapore where like the ho housing is uh, generally owned by the housing development um, board and uh, uh, centrally. Um, uh, governed. Um, so this was a very interesting, interesting, even you could even say hack, yeah, like how something that is uh, so strictly regulated can be broken up with means of like energy, mobility and transport, um, per se, yeah, because we're outside of our four walls um, and in this kind and so much like and for connecting um, these people together. Um, yeah, so uh, like I think I think that there's uh, like the trend is pretty clear. Yeah, with the shared economy, I think it has some setbacks. Um, I think we also have to think a lot about three-dimensional mobility. Um, for example, like my last year, for example, I, I um, uh, like I, I designed and built like the first uh, um, yeah UAM, like a personal air taxi uh, transport hub in Singapore. And this was very interesting to see kind of like all the connected industries, yeah, like and how like technologies are making our airspace ready for today, yeah, creating like all these digital routes already and like opening up the airspace. And all, all this leads, of course, to business cases that need also our governance um, to be reactive, yeah. And this is also what's happening in Europe at the moment. We have the test phase for, uh, um, for like these UAMs, yeah, for like Volocopter or Lilium or whatever they are called uh, um, to create a test field in Europe, yeah, uh, um, um, for flying taxis for three-dimensional mobility. And if this opens up, yeah, it's like also what we had in this one graphic, yeah, from 3D uh, from 2D to 3D, yeah, and this opens so many new um, possibilities, also of people sharing or individualizing. Um, and I think it's personally something that interests me um, very much. And I also think with our airport, we try to get into this field yeah and also incorporate this new means of mobility from the land side and from the air side so we basically create something that is uh, yeah the interface between this yeah and can also grow and shrink with it and i think that was also a very important um, aspect for us in that project yeah this is really interesting uh, now that you were that you were mentioning the examples i thought you know this makes total sense because usually restrictions bring about um, new technologies to innovation, right? Like when there is a, there is a niche for something, uh, then then someone will come up with great ideas. And I actually I actually real, realized that I saw um, some startup that started manufacturing uh, plugins that you can add to a, to a bike, like a regular bicycle to make it an electric bike. Um, I'm thinking maybe you know things like like that or or air travel like you mentioned will become more uh, accessible to to everyone you know it's not going to be that <laughs> and it's exactly this that the rise of niche niche markets because this also hangs together with like the in, the evolution of the internet yeah information exchange much faster and it will like this is like additive markets will become like uh, super interesting and also valuable suddenly because we have new payment systems that are more direct yeah and um, i think it's yeah, it's, it's, it's maybe the same response of when we said before that it's not a one size fits all like just the same way how the single house has just been for a long time like a one size fits all solution which this is not the case um that, and again I, I just think there's a much higher degree and chance for personal allocation and the same thing happens in in transportation, where the single uh, four-seater uh, that fits everyone's life is just not the solution for everybody's life anymore. And there's, um, I don't think there's one solution that will replace that one um, that one four-seater or one new mobility method. But like as Marvin said, it's more about this diversification of uh, and personal allocation of different uh, infrastructure. And that's also why I think we talked about maybe thought the role of an airplane airport changes because it's not anymore 
the interface of one transport mode to the other, but it's maybe the interface of 20 different transport modes from a personal UAV to a, a cheap charter airplane that will still continue to exist, but it will come together with like many different ways of how people arrive and leave to this hub in a way. Uh, Damien, uh, let me know. He has a, a follow-up question. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, so um, it's uh, there is one thing I'm a bit worried about uh, that, um, that the current ideas about how we should create our, for for example, public spaces or how we should shape our streets are becoming uh, obsolete so fast. I mean, because uh, just a moment ago, almost we realized that. Uh, our cities are not uh, competitive for cars, for example, and not, now we are segregating these, uh, you know, uh, uh, this movement uh, uh, of cars. Uh, we try to segregate and separate uh, p pedestrians uh, and uh, segregate them from cars. But uh, in this vision you are you are sharing with us, is it's a bit more complicated than perhaps. All these new infrastructure that we are working working on it now, uh, making this uh, <laughs> this uh, these roads for um, bikes for pedestrians, it's it seems a bit obsolete because uh, in in these visions you are sharing, uh, it is more about, uh, for example, autonomous uh, autonomous mobility and uh, ambient mobility in general. So probably there won't be any need to you know to segregate these kind of vehicles and and movement so yeah. i'm a bit uh, worried about that what seems now a um, new way of thinking about uh, you know ur urban uh, planning it's probably <laughs> it seems a bit old al already well i mean this the thing is i i think that this is a development that will free up a lot of space like the majority Big, big part of our city, uh, I think I had a number how many central parks fit on the streets of New York recently. I think it's like 50 central parks that could fit on all the streets, basically. Like the space that we use for streets and for our cars to move on is actually, it's more than what we give humans to live on in the streets, right? And I think there's a huge potential of, we had this conversation before the lecture started, of uh, giving back that streetscape to the people and giving it a space that is kind of, that is shared, sharedly owned and sharedly used and be this for people walking or be this for anything, but where this becomes an open public space again. And of course, our cities are planned around this and this will not change in uh, overnight that cities are built that the way they are built, but there's a potential of repurposing and reusing the space that has been uh, both for parking and for traffic that has been wasted for a very small use case for a long, long time, where our the building of the planning of our cities was dictated by a one technological case scenario of the single car in a way. And I think there's a lot of potential and of our cities to adapt and react to this again. And I, I'm just going to repeat what I said, what we talked about before. Um, now during the pandemic where everyone is locked in, a lot of the streets have been pedestrianized in New York uh, over the weekend. And this was a conversation that happened for years that designers were asking for pedestrianizing traffic and it got always rejected by the cities because it was said it's not possible. And all of when there's a scenario like now where it has to be, all of a sudden it's very much possible and there's not a problem with the traffic. And it, I think maybe, it's, it, maybe it needs, uh, a traumatic event or a crisis to happen to force some of this change to happen. But then I guess something positive comes out of a, 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 a catastrophe or a trauma in this case. And it is really that you see, well, actually some large highways in New York City are being locked down. Like where if I would have told a city planner two years ago, let's lock down Vanderbilt Avenue in Brooklyn. I, it would have been rejected as completely crazy, this idea, but now we have it and it's completely possible and people take back that space. And it's a really great development where, uh, the, because nobody can be inside, so everybody's sprawling on the streets. And this was the first time where I was there last weekend and I kind of this vision or these renderings that we've seen for many years of autonomous vehicle, like being on a shared street was the first time where I felt like this is what it could feel like. Like this is what our cities could be like if, uh, the streetscapes would be rethought and would be re 
to a shared model. And I, I don't know, I was really excited when I saw this in reality, because this was probably the closest that I've experienced in person to this idea of a city that takes back its streets. And I think it's possible. Uh, the traffic still works. It's just it needs it needs a trigger to uh, implement it. But it, but it also comes with new challenges, I think. Yeah, uh, and, and and that's the thing that's that's, that's making it so different than uh, than before. Yeah, like uh, um, like uh, what happens when we ban the cars from the street? Yeah, like because we're not there with autonomous mobility. Yeah, in the end of the day, but like um, we see this in incredible increase like everybody reads it now jeff bezos yeah <laughs> it's another trillion or something and um, but we see this enormous increase in e-commerce yeah and uh, somehow nowadays we see like these packages um, have to come to our home yeah but what happens when the streets are uh, not allowed for combustion engines uh, um, for example anymore yeah and um, how does this happen yeah and one of these uh, things also led us like uh, like uh, last year to uh, um, this yeah, lo logistics projects, uh, which you saw with this, uh, yeah, micro logistics centers that are activated by drone, yeah, and can still stand there and uh, like uh, little hubs, um, where people can get their packages for a certain amount of time and then they can be deployed again. Um, but these are like also, these are things that we think a about a lot. Um, and it makes it because this ecosystem of mobility is so much more diverse now and this makes it, uh, yeah, challenging, but also like also creates, as we said before, like these niche opportunities um, for inventions. And that's really cool. I also believe that what Mario just said, there's a lot of new challenges that arise, um, but the only way of dealing with them is prematurely dealing with them, like not closing them down, but in a way engaging them with them before they become a problem. I also know that, I don't know, in Paris, they introduced this electric scooter sharing model. That was a huge success. But then it ended up with just the streets being cluttered everywhere of people that use the scooter but don't own it. So, of course, you also have a different sense of responsibility. If you don't own something, people also tend to treat it differently. Like, I think it's kind of comes with a re-educating of how do we treat shared things and shared ownership um, where the city was just cluttered with people throwing the scooter after usage in the corners. And, of course, it's kind of, I mean, these new, mo it's not like the new models solve every problem from one day to another but they kind of they have to they come with a changed consumer behavior and it's also i think a lot of our projects that deal with i don't know technology is about um i don't know educating about these new processes or um technologies and kind of making the way how they work or underlying systems visible and really i don't know i think just give someone a new technology is not enough you kind of have to create a platform where the behavior of the people is ready to to use it i guess thank you um we have a question from aya youssef aya um yeah i want to thank you again for the amazing presentation and um, I have a question that's not directly related to the presentation and what you already presented. Um, actually, I'm into AR and everything that's related to tech and architecture and how it can be implemented through the architecture curriculum. And as like a third year architecture student from the American University of Beirut, I would like to ask if you ever offer, uh, offer internship programs, whether remotely or in person, I would like be more than glad to apply if there is any. I think you've got. That. <laughs> I mean, our, our working conditions, of course, are also uh, we are always adapting to new working conditions, especially in the last six months. Um, but we are also always interested in any sort of collaboration or, um, yeah, that is so, I, I don't, I guess you, yeah, if you contact us an email, um, but at the moment we also, yeah, we are, of course, we're setting up our, setting up our infrastructure right now and our new ways of working, um, still at the time, but yeah, we're always interested in any talent and collaboration.
Thank you so much. Maybe also the, the, the Laka guys can connect you. They have our email addresses. Um, so it's like also like we have a little technical problem at the moment uh, with, the, with the server infrastructure. We can <laughs> Um, but that, like that, that's why we're we using also, uh, yeah, so, but uh, just like connect to us and uh, we can start a discussion. Sure, will do. Thank you so much. We, we can assist. Aya, have you left your email address uh, when you registered for the webinar? If not, you can just shoot me a message and I'll, I'll keep it. Okay, I'll send it again. We'll, we'll contact you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I think we have one last question from Wendy. Yep. Uh, so my question is a bit more general, maybe, um, I don't know. I'm just wondering and maybe more personal as well. Uh, just what are you both each separately together, whatever, uh, excited about in the future, you know, just, um, any projects that you have going on or any ideas that you have had recently or initiatives, uh, anything that you have seen in the recent technological advancements, just in the world in general, that kind of thing. Um, cause I mean, we're all in the middle of a pandemic and I think we all need some, some inspirational outlooks, you know, I, I um, think some, I mean, some of them we shared or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, firstly, I mean, like, like, uh, like, like personally for us is, I think for us, this work on the urban beta project will be really cool because, uh, um, we're still in the like second phase of application process or something, but like it, this is a big opportunity to get uh, funded uh, for research by government. And um, so this would be something that um, uh, is very close to our hearts uh, um, because it has, a, it has a very strong social cause and it has the power to change um, the law, actually. Um, um, not tomorrow, yeah, but with... Uh, like this uh, fundamental approach, we already handed in like a second application for that, um, like a follow up. Um, I think that's something that it's very, um, that's uh, like, yeah, or like, yeah, at least uh, it's moving us a lot um, at the moment. Um, the second thing, I think I mentioned it before, <laughs> was the European Bauhaus. Um, I think it moved us so much to build up uh, like uh, um, like a little academic workshop curriculum around it uh, in the very near future, very very near future. Um, um, yeah, it, it moves me a lot uh, just from my side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean maybe as a kind of for us where we develop as a student, we've been working together for ten years, and I think it's really exciting for us to see that a lot of the things and topics that we have ever like. I think we've been working, so Marvin and me have been working together for over 10 years. Um, and in this time, there's a lot of, I think, things and topics that we were always invested and in, interested in, but we saw, uh, I think we really see now where a lot of the themes and maybe abstract topics that we really were interested in are coming into reality. And we also see a huge, I think, over the recent uh, few years, huge, huge uh, synergy between our research and practice that has not been the case like this 10 years ago. And I think we really see a lot of exciting potential, even if we talked about um, what you mentioned before, our like uh, uh, autonomous mobility project. If I think about it, it was 10 years ago and a lot of the things that we talked back then were like uh, thought models or abstract thought models. And a lot of this, I, I don't know, it really it makes me excited to see some uh, a lot of these things actually happening now um and so i think we've got a very optimistic uh we've got a very optimistic world here in general i would say even like the approach everything about how do we teach during the pandemic and i need to respond to these things i don't think that our world is going to be like this forever i just will go but there's things that are positive changes that we can take from it we will recover from this and this is kind of going this is gonna go. This is gonna go away, and people will uh, build up. It, it it will only go away if we respond appropriately to it. But if we, if there's a possibility of moving past this, but there's also a lot of things that can be learned from it. And I think it's lesser. We will never be socially close together again. I think it is more in a, how do we plan and live that we can react to this better and. And what happened in these times that actually are positive changes, like how do we use our, how the minimal means that we have, how do we use them better and how do we communicate virtually? I think that was really exciting for me as well, how 
uh, people opened up to, to new things because yeah. you're forced to it. So you're yeah. forced to be creative about how you use your technology, how you communicate, how you enjoy yeah. your and, life. And as you said continue. earlier, sometimes you do need to be forced to make that change. Like you were talking about the roads yeah. in New York, for example. Like, yeah. I, I think also just also like seeing this in a, in a bigger frame or something, it's like this projects we're doing and you could also maybe always see them that they kind of extend beyond this formal act of building itself. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so maybe that's also why or for the, from the introduction, yeah, like maybe we're not these classical architects or other things um, kind of move us that like have more to do with like uh, social, economical and ecological aspects. Um, maybe also political agendas. Yeah, more and more. I, I have to admit, yeah. <laughs> um, it comes all yeah, the same. <laughs> yeah, it, but it's in the end all about like creating like like sufficient solutions for um, like ch challenges we have. Yeah, and like we're not necessarily the people who uh, who uh, um, turn down or whatever. Yeah, like we try to negotiate with the future in the end of the day, and then that's. I think that's just. That will be also exciting in 10 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's awesome. From, from what I can tell, we don't have any uh, further questions. So I guess we're going to finish the question and answer period. And that'll be the end of the webinar. Uh, so just again, thank you to both Marvin and Paul for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and if anyone in the audience, if you missed part of it or if you joined late or whatever, um, we, we have been recording it and uh, we, we record all of our webinars so you can go back and watch, you can rewatch this, really absorb the information. It's been a lot. It's a lot to take in all at once. So, you know, feel free to, at your own pace, uh, follow Laka on Instagram or Facebook and you can find a link to our podcast or webinars, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, guys. And I hope everyone has a great day. <laughs> thanks, thanks, so thanks for having us. us. It's been awesome. Well, it was a pleasure collaborating again. Um, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.